I hold a beast, a celestial being and a maniac inside of me. It's up to you which one you meet. In the last two episodes of Pulp and Art I covered two Hulk runs, so I want to finish this trilogy with a last trip down memory lane into the early 2000s and one specific run that changed my life forever. Last time I talked about Bruce Jones' run and how it made me a comic book fan. That is true, but even before that I had held different comic books in my hands. So now I want to talk about the very first Marvel comic book that I have ever read. In the early 2000s, Paul Jenkins took the reins of the Hulk and presented us with a very depressed and melancholic trip into Banner's psyche. This right here is the very first Marvel comic book that I have ever read. In Germany, these comic books were always two single issues printed together, but a lot of the time they would just leave out certain stories and issues. I guess because of budgetary reasons and a very small audience at the time? I have no idea. But yeah, that was the first time that I have ever read anything like it and it was primarily because I had been watching a lot of the 90s Hulk cartoon on TV and I knew a big blockbuster was coming out soon. So, how can I describe this run? Al Ewing's take is a very political horror story delving into the current society and how it shapes our rage against it. Bruce Jones' take was very cinematic, a noir horror thriller focused on paranoia and plot twists. Paul Jenkins, on the other hand, does something different with the Hulk, going deep into Bruce Banner's psyche, since his beloved wife, Betty Banner, has just been killed by his longtime nemesis, Emil Blonsky, aka The Abomination. The run consists of different chapters, just like Banner's mind is splintered into different personalities. At this point of Bruce Banner's life, he has at least three different Hulk personas that live inside him. There is the typical Hulk, a dumb and angry manifestation of the drama that his father caused him. Then there is Mr. Fixit, a Grey Hulk persona that's a representation of Banner's teenage years. A know-it-all arrogant douchebag who used to work in Las Vegas as a bouncer and a Hulk persona called The Professor, which at first seems like Banner and the Hulk have merged into one being, a smarter version of the Hulk that we know, but a question arises in a storyline later in the run. The question of identity. Is the Professor really a merged version of Hulk and Banner? Is Banner even in control? Or is the Professor just another Hulk and Bruce is still not in charge of his body and mind? What's so cool and interesting about the run is that the different storylines also have different tones different atmospheres and different themes, since due to the fact that Bruce Banner is now also suffering from a deadly disease called ALS, the Hulks need to take over his body to protect him from his upcoming, slowly creeping death. So yeah, we are dealing with very deep and melancholic stuff here. Betty is dead, Bruce is dying and his heart is still desiring revenge against Emil Blonsky, while his different heart personas share his body and fight for the spotlight. What's interesting about Paul Jenkins' take on the Hulk is that our current immortal Hulk actually takes one very important aspect of this story. The Devil Hulk persona, who is born in the very first issues. Jenkins portrays the Devil Hulk as an evil snake creature that wants to take over the Hulk and destroy the Earth, which L. Ewing not really retconned, but gave even more death by explaining that Bruce only saw the Devil Hulk as something evil because he wasn't able to see somebody who loved him in a good light. But anyways, back to Jenkins' version. So the Devil Hulk is actively trying to escape his inner prison and Banner needs his other personas to help him contain this creature. His biggest fear is that when he dies, 
the Devil Hulk will take over and he has nobody to help him with that. As for usual, there's also somebody from the military that wants the Hulk for some reason. In this case, General Riker, an evil general who bends every rule and even uses General Ross, Betty's father, to come closer to the Hulk. I won't give away why he's doing what he's doing and what's his plan, but there's kind of a bittersweet reason why he's such a disgusting antagonist and I generally liked his character. Sadly, he never really shows up in Hulk comic books with a bigger part, so I guess he's a little wasted here. Nevertheless, I did enjoy him as an antagonist and he does push the Hulk to a new limit because Due to Riker's meddling of Bruce's psyche, a revelation about the Professor persona occurs and that maybe he really isn't a merged version of Bruce and Hulk. What follows is a very diverse variety of storylines. Each story coming from one of the different Hulks. We have an alien mystery storyline with Mr. Fixit, which is more tongue-in-cheek humor and not really serious at all. Then a mob teams up to take care of Mr. Fixit, and while still being tongue-in-cheek, the comic plays out more like a crime mobster plot, which fits the character of Mr. Fixit for sure. Then we switch to a Savage Hulk story, which is probably the best of the run and the most known, where we learn about the current state of the Abomination after being responsible for the death of Betty Banner, and we see the full grief of Bruce and how he can't handle Betty's death. It's very melancholic, raw and just sad seeing the two monsters go into to a fight while both of them essentially lost somebody that they love. This one is really good and even if you are not a Hulk fan or you just don't want to read the whole run, I really suggest reading this storyline. We then jump into another favorite plot of mine, where suddenly everything is perfect for Bruce. Betty is still alive, he has daughters and even his father is back from the dead, but they have a great relationship. Well, that sounds weird, right? You can probably already guess, but there is a lot more to it than that. So I highly recommend this read for another mind-bending tale of grief, disillusion and ultimately acceptance. Paul Jenkins ends his take on the Hulk with Professor Hulk. Bruce is finally dying of his disease, ALS, and the only option left for him is to turn into the Hulk forever. It's a very adult and sad plotline that features many characters from the Marvel Universe all trying to help Bruce. The ending is kind of a cop out, but there is a great sequence leading up to it featuring the leader, Samuel Stearns, which L. Ewing also cleverly took and made it part of his Immortal Hulk story. In the Immortal Hulk video I made, I focused on the themes and commentary of the author. While my Bruce Jones video was more of a recommendation and discussion of what the run actually is and its problems, so for this video I want to do both things. Let's talk about the quality of the run. I think it's kind of all over the place, but that's sort of the point. I really love melancholic, dark, psychological stuff, but I'm not a huge fan of outlandish concepts like the Mr. Fixit stuff, so this run kind of perfectly works as a representation of Hulk's psyche. It's pretty crowded in there and all over the place, but there's something for everybody. You like comics that are more fun and over exaggerated? Well, here's Mr. Fixit fighting mobsters. You like a deep character study with a lot of atmosphere? Check out Bruce Banner grieving over his wife. It's all in here and it's a perfect metaphor for the DID that Bruce is suffering from. The main theme that I take away from the story is acceptance is one of the most important things in life. Accepting that a person you love died. Accepting your own mortality. Accepting that yes, life can be hard, but you can build yourself a dream paradise and hide in different personas. You need to step up leave the past behind and accept who you are, what you will become 
and the cause of your actions. Let's get back to the quote from the beginning of the video. I hold a beast, a celestial being and a maniac inside of me. It's up to you which one you meet. Well, after having read this one, I would rephrase that. I hold a beast, a celestial being and a maniac inside of me. It's up to me which one you meet. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you liked it. If you did, be sure to leave a like, subscribe to this channel and hit the notification bell if you want to see more videos. Until next time, stay pulpy and stay artsy. See ya.